it's always an exciting time when the shoes come to visit us. It's nice to have both of them here this morning. I, I told them this morning that it's nice to have a pair of shoes. So we're glad that they're here. Larry, you always do um, such a wonderful job of sharing with us, and, and uh, we want to welcome you at this time to come and speak. It's a pleasure to uh, be here uh, this morning. Uh, Joel, uh, whenever I speak, he always sends me a link to uh, uh, to this church's website uh, so I can uh, watch watch my message. And I watched it, and two things uh, became clear. Um, one, uh, when I was here, it was the end of June, and I I watched. I'm like, man, I look so relaxed. It was summertime. And I'm thinking, I've been through two months of teaching middle schoolers. I, I, I just looked at myself and I just marveled at just how relaxed I was. But, you know, two months into middle school, it's a little bit different. You've got to make yourself calm down. The, the second thing um, you know, I noticed is, uh, is, man, was I talking your guys' ears off before I, I got to the actual sermon. It took me 15 minutes. And I'm thinking, man, my job is not to sit here and talk your ear off. My job is to, you know, to, to deliver, you know, God's word to you. So, so with that said... Um, I'm going to get to the message. <laughs> Seriously, 15 minutes. It was, I was, you know, one of those things when you watch yourself on a video, you're like, wow. It just, it's very, very surprising and shocking. So, so I am, I'm just going to jump into, uh, into the message. And I also, uh, I also held you guys over. I was like three or four minutes late. So, uh, I promise that I will be very punctual this time. But either way, it's a pleasure, uh, being here this morning, uh, again. And, uh, just always a, a pleasure when, uh, when uh, your pastor invites me out, and of course, just uh, love uh, um, love the Jaegers, uh, you know, with all my heart. Uh, so we're going to hop on in. Um, sometimes uh, my wife likes to challenge me, and I like it. This was that time. In my hands was my wife's necklace, which has a cross on it. And it was all tangled up. And we had to leave a church in like five minutes. So the pressure was on. So the challenge was there. Did I overcome the challenge? Heck yeah, is what a cocky person would say. But being a humble person, I say, by God's grace, I got it done. <laughs> but I got it done in five minutes, and, and she was able to to wear it. Ladies, quick question. Does anyone have problems with necklaces getting all tangled up? Just, just show of hands. Anyone? Yeah, oh, yes, absolutely. And, there, and, and sometimes it's a mess, and you wonder, how did they get like that, right? I got it untangled, and of course, you know, my wife then was able to to put it on because it was untangled. Everyone knows when a a necklace is tangled, you can't get it on. Everyone knows that. And and what was uh, was neat is while I was untangling the the necklace, it uh, it reminded me of of something. It reminded me of a a couple of uh, verses in uh, in God's Word. Romans 13, 14 and Galatians 3, 27 it, they, those two verses encourage us to put on Christ, to clothe ourselves with Christ. Which, to put on Christ, that, that is our ultimate goal, right? Because sanctification, right, in God's Word, is God forming us into the image of Jesus Christ more and more each day. And that is called the will of, of God. However, we cannot do that uh, if we cause our Christianity to be tangled and complicated. We do a good job at times complicating our Christianity, complicating our relationship with Jesus Christ, so it's like a, a tangled mess. And when, when it's tangled, we can't put on Christ. Now, we, we know that's true because in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verse 3, 
which indicates that we can get away from a pure devotion to Christ. And when we get away from that pure devotion to Christ, that is like that tangled necklace where we can't put on Christ and, and we can't uh, be in the heart of God, sanctification, be made more like Christ more and more. So I'm, I'm going to uh, present to you three lessons from a boat. Three lessons from a boat in the Gospels, which I hope God uses in your life and mine, uh, to untangle anything in our walk with God. Allowing us to put on Christ with ease, allowing us to put on Christ with simplicity. Will you uh, please join me in prayer? Father and God, we, we come before you, we, we thank you first and foremost that you are the one, the true, the almighty God. There is none like you. There is no other entity, no other being that even compares to you. And you love us completely. We thank you for that love, God. We thank you that we are your children. We, we thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. And as you are faithful... We go to your word, which is faithful and true. And, uh, and I pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit that indwells all of us through our faith in Christ, I pray that your Spirit would soften us, soften our hearts, because we know that our hearts are our soil, and we know that your word is seed. I pray, Father, that as... Your word, uh, as we expose our heart to your word, that seed, that you would uh, grow it uh, so that, again, we would grow closer and closer to you and more like your son. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would, uh, if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Uh, The verses that were read earlier this morning is going to be the second passage that we hit. Uh, but this is going to be Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Again, it is a lesson from a boat. And again, these three lessons, the purpose is to, uh, to, to grab these lessons, to put them all together, and, and to see uh, how we can untangle anything in our life, allowing us, uh, allowing us to put on Christ, again, which is God's ultimate goal for us. Uh, our life. Chapter 5. Now it came about that while the multitude was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the multitudes from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Verse 5, And Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing. Now I'm just going to just pause right there. Um, Most people agree that when Peter said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, um, he wasn't purely giving Jesus information. He was expressing his frustration. They had worked all day and nothing happened. All day and nothing happened. And Jesus is saying, just, just toss your nets out to the right of the boat. And pretty sure that in Peter's heart, you know, when he said that, Peter was giving Jesus the whatever Lord. You know what whatever is mean, right? It's just dismissal, whatever. And most people agree that his attitude was not the best, nor would mine be the best, if I was tired, worked all night, and nothing happened. So, we're going to, uh, to jump back in again. And Simon answered and said, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but at your bidding I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. And they signaled to their partners into the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of the fish 
which they had taken. And so also John, James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon, and Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear, from now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Uh, a couple things. Um, Peter's reaction. So, they worked all night. Their labor was fruitless. No money is going to be made. Jesus says to put the nets off to the right, and they caught so much fish, the nets were almost breaking. To them, fish equals money. Right? I'm thinking maybe if I were in Peter's shoes... What I would be hearing, right, is cha-ching. Hey, Jesus, can we go into business together? 60-40. Right? If it was that easy, fish equals money to them. It's their business. Day in, day out, you're raking in that much fish. I'm thinking I can make a pretty good living. But that was not Peter's response. What, what was his response? His response was fear... And shame. He falls to Jesus' knees and he says something fascinating. He says, depart from me. In short, get out of here. Go. Go away. Why? Because I am a sinful man. He was afraid. Why? Why was he afraid? Perhaps his doubt. Uh, the, the miracle. Uh, the miracle weirded him out a little bit. He didn't know how to react. Uh, but what Peter was coming, uh, what he was running into, what he was having to confront was the holiness of Jesus. Now, that's not in the passage. It doesn't say that Peter was afraid because Jesus Christ was holy. It's not there, but it's all over it. Why is that? Uh, first, let me just kind of remind you what the word holy means. Because we talk about God is holy and Jesus was holy. And, <clears throat> excuse me, that word holy is a fascinating word. Uh, in the Old Testament, where we find it, that word holy has two meanings. It has a secondary meaning and a primary meaning. The secondary meaning is pure. Uh, if something is, is holy, it's, it's pure. God is, God is 100% pure. That's why we call him holy. The primary meaning, though, is, is a little odd. The primary meaning of, of the word holy is, is set apart. Which set apart means it's something that is totally in every way different than anything that you've ever seen or known. What we call that, psychologically speaking, they call it xenophobia. We, it's, it's that fear of that which is extremely different from us. Fear. And that's, that's normal. Uh, that's, that's normal for everyone. Uh, if, if you're in a situation that's totally different, usually there's a small level of discomfort or a big level of discomfort. If, if you are an extrovert, you're very comfortable around people. If you are a severe introvert, you're not very comfortable around people. And so that, that's that idea. It's, it, it's set apart. God is set apart. He is so completely other and different. When people see it, they have fear. Now, that is a very normal thing in the Bible, and it happens a lot. Uh, I'm just going to quickly sh- uh, take you to Isaiah chapter 6, just so we can bring it out a little bit, so we can understand Peter's reaction. So that has a big, big part of us untangling uh, our walk with God, entangling our Christianity, not having our Christianity complex. So let's go ahead and zip to Isaiah chapter 6. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 6. We find in Isaiah chapter 6... We find uh, about six chapters in, we find uh, Isaiah being called by God into ministry. And it's a fascinating call. And I'm just going to uh, read uh, the first six verses or so. And, uh, and this is uh, chapter six. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I, Isaiah, saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted with the train of his rope filling the temple. Seraphim, angels, stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. 
and the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. And notice Isaiah's reaction, verse 5. Then I said, woe is me for I am ruined. Woe is me. It's, it, woe is me is like, is like I, I am completely in every way uh, distraught right now. And then what he says after that, he says, I am ruined. Uh, that word ruined also means undone. I am undone. So the best way to think about when Isaiah says, woe is me, I am totally distraught, I am undone. The word undone is best understood by having a skein of yarn. If you take a skein of yarn and you take the yarn and you keep pulling, right? Pull, pull, pull till it's all gone. You got a whole mess of yarn. You had the skein. That is how Isaiah saw himself, as the full skein. And then after he experienced the holiness of God, he saw himself as all the yarn just in a jumbled mess. I am undone. Why? Because of God's holiness. It's what it does to you. And there's another thing that the holiness of God does to you. Do you remember what Peter said when he, when he said, depart from me, get away from me, you're holy? He says, I'm a sinful man. Whenever we're exposed to the holiness of God, for whatever reason, we become acutely aware of our sin. That's why Peter said, go away, for I am a sinful man. And look what Isaiah says. He says, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. So he immediately becomes aware of his sin. God didn't have to say, you're sinful. It just happens when we experience the holiness of God. Fear and shame of our sin. It's fascinating. It's a fa- and, you, and this is not, these aren't the only two places we find it in Scripture. You find it all over the place. It's absolutely a, an amazing uh, thing to, uh, to see. So when the fishermen saw Jesus' holiness, right, he told them he will make them fishers of men. And how did they respond? Did, did you notice in the passage, did they have a meeting and say, hey, what do you guys think we should do? No, they all immediately did what? They followed him. They saw his holiness, right? That fear was there. And when Jesus told them what to do, they did it. Same thing in Isaiah. Check it out. So here's Isaiah, right? If, as, you, uh, as you read a, a little bit uh, further on, uh, God uh, basically is talking about a ministry opportunity. And he says, whom shall I send? And Isaiah did not hesitate. He says, here am I, send me. Amazing. Fear of the Lord, right? So is anyone, is anyone familiar with the proverb that says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of someone? Did I hear it? Wisdom. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's beautiful. Why? Because I don't know if you remember, I was here, I'm not sure if I covered it the last time I was here, but a while back we talked about, uh, I shared with you the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is what you know, wisdom allows you to do what you know to be right. You see, I can know all the right things to do, but if I don't do the right things, that makes me a fool. If I know what is right, and I have wisdom, then... I'm able to do what is right. Big difference between knowledge and wisdom. And so what we have here is we have people who have truly experienced the fear of the Lord. And because of that fear, then comes wisdom. And then that wisdom is to know to do what's right. God calls you to do something, you do it. It's fear of the Lord. Such a, such a fascinating, fascinating thing when you, you start, uh, you start thinking about it. And again, we see many, many, many examples of this in, in Scripture. So just to, just to wrap up the, the, the lesson of, of the first book, we're just going to pack it up nice and neat. Holiness leads us to fear God and obey Him. That's, that's really as simple as, as it is. Are there other lessons here in the book? Yeah, but that, that's the one I want you to, to snag. Holiness leads us to fear God and obey Him. And remember, just I want you to remember as we move on to the next lesson, I want you to remember Peter's reaction when he sees the miracle of the fish, right? He falls to his knees and he says, Go away from me, for I'm a sinful man. I want you to remember that. Hold on to that. Let's go on to lesson number two. <laughs> lesson number two, it's the one that was read uh, earlier. Uh, it's Mark chapter four. Uh, so again, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and 
Flip on over to Mark chapter 4, verse 35. Verse 35 through 41. I'll read it again. It was read very, very well. Uh, But if uh, you're like me, uh, you might be thinking, what did they read about? So I'll read it again uh, for all of our sakes. So 35 through 41. And on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go over to the other side. And leaving the multitude, they took him along with them just as he was in the boat, and the other boats were with him. Am I reading the right passage? Yes. Okay. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat, so much that the boat was already filling up. Just pause right there. This is a real-life situation where they think they're going to die. And in a lot of situations, them being fishermen and experienced, they know that that could be the case. So I don't know if you've ever been in a situation that's really, really dangerous and you think you're going to die. That's scary. Like, really scary. If it doesn't get your attention, right, one of two things are going on. Either you're damaged in the head or you're God. And for a human... It would have to be that you're damaged in the head. Unless, unless there's the impact of God, right? So let me, let me continue on here. So, the boat is filling up with water, right? Okay, and, goes on. He, Jesus, was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. Time out. Time out. The boat's about to sink, the water's filling up, and Jesus is asleep on on a cushion. Not the least bit worried. Not the least bit worried. Now this is something that is so abundantly true. The more Jesus is in you, the less you panic about the storm around you. The more that Jesus is in you and in me, the less you panic about the storm around you. That is so, that is so true. And of course, you're thinking, boy, that's, that sounds like great advice. You know, how do I get there? Let's, let's continue to, uh, to, uh, to read on. He was asleep on a cushion, and they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? That is the quote of the millennium, saying to Jesus, God, who gave them life and who will save them, asking Jesus, don't you care? We're perishing. They're panicking, right? They think Jesus doesn't care and he doesn't, uh, he has just just clueless. So they, they are in a world of hurt and they think that Jesus doesn't care. And being woken up, being aroused, he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, hush, be still. And the wind died down, and it became perfectly calm. Uh, Let me just see if I can paint this picture to you so you can understand how crazy it is. You know, when you're in a a storm, right, you know it's loud. I'm sure the waves are hitting the boat. Jesus, don't you care? We're perishing. Peace be still. And then, quiet. And all you hear is drip, drip, drip from the sail coming down. And then quiet. I'm sure the disciples then were like, Whoo! Boy, that was a close one. Thanks, Jesus. You're awesome. Because they got what they wanted, right? Didn't they get what they wanted? If you could ask them, what would you like right now? They'd be like, we want the storm to stop, right? That's what they would say. And they got what they wanted. But they weren't thankful. What were they? Eh. The storm became perfectly calm. And he said to them, Why are you so timid? How is it that you have no faith? And they become very much afraid and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So they're not thankful. They're afraid. They got what they wanted. They were afraid because they thought they were going to die. He saved them from the circumstance. And then they were even more terrified. Why? Same thing is when he... In the other boat, 
right? The miracle, they saw his holiness, and they were completely uh, afraid. His holiness, same thing, totally terrified. All the same ingredients are here in the boat as was in the last boat, right? Peter and the disciples, they saw Christ's holiness through his power, but this time God said that they were terrified. Terrified, right? Why? Same reason why Isaiah said, Woe to me, for I am undone. But the truly fascinating thing is that the disciples got what they wanted. Think about it. Before they cried out to Jesus, they were scared of dying in the storm, but after Jesus calmed the storm, they were terrified, right? But of Jesus. They were terrified of Jesus. Lesson number two, very similar to one. If we are in that stage of fearing the Lord, be sure to stay near the Lord because you need his peace. And remember, the more Jesus you have in you, the bigger your peace when the storms of life try to thrash you. That's the second lesson that we have. Let's let's move on to the third lesson. This is in John 21. John 21. If you've got your Bibles, you can flip on over to John 21, verses 1 to 7. Verses 1 to 7. So, we have this passage here. Um, Jesus uh, was crucified, dead, buried, and rose again. He had, already, he had already appeared to the disciples. He had already appeared to Doubting Thomas. Remember the Doubting Thomas passage? So this is, this is afterwards. All right. I think I am in... Nope, here we go. After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he manifested himself in this way. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will also come with you. They went out, they got in the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Again. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus therefore said to them, children, you do not have any fish, do you? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find a catch. They cast, therefore, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of That disciple, therefore, whom Jesus loved, that's John, said to Peter, it is the Lord. And so when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea just to get to Jesus. So back in the beginning of Jesus' ministry in in Luke chapter 5, right? Peter sees Jesus do a miracle with fish and his response is fear. And an overwhelming sense of his sinfulness and all he wants is for Jesus to go away, right? Depart from me for I'm a sinful man. Get out of here. Go. I can't stand to be in your presence. Later on in Jesus' ministry, Peter and the disciples see Jesus calm a storm and the response is that they are terrified of him. They're terrified of him. They can't tell him to go away because he's in a boat with them. But now, but now we find Peter seeing the exact same miracle as in Luke 5, but his response is so profoundly different, right? In Luke 5, we found Peter fearful of Christ's holiness. In Luke 5, we found Peter ashamed of his sin. In Luke 5, we found Peter wanting Jesus to just leave him alone and go away. What happened over the two to three years that the the disciples spent with Jesus to get Peter to the point of such drastic change? From fear shame, and a desire for Jesus to just go away 
to jumping out of a boat because he's so impatient because he can't wait another ten minutes to be with Jesus. There's only one explanation. Really only one. And that is that Peter finally got to that point that he understood in an experiential way that Jesus loves him. That the love of God traveled from Peter's head because in the beginning he would have told you in his head, Jesus loves me. But that knowledge with wisdom went down into his heart. Why did his fear disappear? Why did his fear disappear? Why did his shame disappear? Why did his desire to have Jesus be away when he experienced his holiness, why did that disappear? And the answer is just so beautifully simple. It's found in 1 John 4.18, and it simply says, there is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear. Where are you at with regards to God's love for you? Where, where am I at? Which Jesus do you know? Is it the one that you have to afraid of and so you obey out of fear? Maybe you obey because you think God will, will punish you? Or is the Jesus that you know, is he the one like Peter in John 21, where you just run to him, you can't wait to be with him. Day in, day out, because of his love for you. Peter in John 21 is a great example of what we call transformation. You know, transformation, change. He was living the transformational life because the Peter found in Mark 5 completely different than in John 21, right? Mark 5, fear, shame, and just get away from me. And John 21, just love and a desire to be close to Jesus. No matter what, I'm going to jump out in the water and just get soaked just so I can be with him. Uh, quicker. He was transformed by God's love. Now, here is the thing that's important for you to know and for I to know. And and that is that you and I, we can grow to know, not know, know. When I say when I say know in the heart, it's it's experiencing God's love. Not just the knowledge, but we can grow to experience God's love more and more and more and more. We can. Let me uh, take you to one last little passage in Ephesians chapter 3. In Ephesians chapter 3, it's verses 17 and 19. And I remember the first time I stumbled on this passage. I gave a message on this passage a long time ago at a church I was attending in, uh, in Warsaw. And, uh, and the, the passage just blew me away. I'm just going to read you uh, three of the verses. It's 17 18 and 19. And this is a prayer request of Paul. And, uh, and he's praying that, uh, that Christ would dwell in our hearts through faith. And that you and I, being rooted and grounded in love, God's love for us, that we may be able to comprehend, know with all the saints, what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. So it's Paul praying, right, that you and I would know the love of God. Now, that's an odd prayer. Why? Because Paul is writing to the Ephesians who are believers in Christ. He's writing to the Christians, and he's praying that they would know God's love. Well, couldn't they say, oh, well, well, Paul, we, we know God loves us. No, 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 no. That's not what Paul is talking about. Whenever you see the word know in the Bible, it doesn't have to do with this kind of knowledge, because this kind of knowledge really 
It's no good until it hits the heart. And so Paul is praying that you and I, that we would grow in experiencing God's love in our life more and more and more. The complicated Christian life, we can complicate it in many, many, many different ways. Maybe it's through rules. Maybe it is uh, through, uh, again, not a a desire to be seeking growth. Maybe uh, there there are things in my life and our lives where it's patterns of behavior that just keep us down. Whatever it is, the number one thing that can untangle that necklace that has the cross on it is you pursuing and talking to God and asking Him to know His love more and more and more. Because as you experience God's love more and more, that is when, like Peter, we start living a transformational life. And when you live that transformational life, you are putting on Christ and you are right in the heartbeat of God because God desires to to change you into the image of Jesus Christ more and more each day. And as you are experiencing his love, you'll be loving those around you. And that, that is how a necklace that is all, all bunched up just becomes something that you can get apart and just put on. Putting on Christ. Let's pray. Father, none of us are going to be living that transformational life in Christ, clothing ourselves with your Son, our Lord, unless we are experiencing your love deeply in our lives receiving that love from you that is shed abroad in our hearts and, and Father, just needs to, to simply be stirred up by your Holy Spirit that is in us, allowing that love to be lived out. And again, it is all for one purpose, to spread the fame of your name for your glory. Again, Father, work within us your love Work your love in us deeper and deeper, knowing that you who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete it. May we just pursue this week with all of our heart, soul, and strength to love you and love those around us, putting on Christ. And may your love just simply cause the complex things in our Christian walk to simply be the simplicity of following after you and being loved by you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys, and you are dismissed.